police officers armed with uh, machine guns, tear gas, uh, bombs, over. It's police, then why are they after you? We've got a statement here from our clients, so we're going to play that on the loudspeaker. Uh, please uh, remove yourself from these waters. You're in violation of international conservation regulations. We're acting in accordance with the United Nations World Charter for Nature and implementing these regulations. You're in a whale sanctuary and you're assisting in illegal activity. Remove yourself from these waters immediately. Please uh, remove yourself from these waters. You're in violation of international conservation regulations. Get out of here and stop your pirate whaling operation. This is the filing law. We're no protest ship. Now get out of here sense that whenever uh, there is no law enforcement body with the jurisdiction to enforce uh, international regulations and laws, we're not going to stand idly by and watch these laws be broken just because no governments have the political will to do anything to stop it. So we've set ourselves up as that law enforcement body. Captain Paul Watson, welcome to the channel. How are you? Oh, thank you very much. Doing well. Perfect. Great. I've actually been following your work um ever since uh you know uh sam carter from architects you know the band yes, yeah sir. so he talks about you guys a lot and uh, with sea shepherd and talks about you a lot for anyone who's not aware of like the exact kind of work that you've been doing how would you explain it in a nutshell well i call what we do uh, aggressive uh, non-violence and that is intervention mm -hmm. uh, without causing injury i was a co-founder of greenpeace in uh, 1972 mm -hmm. and, and i left greenpeace in 77 because uh it was really just all about taking pictures documentation hanging banners and uh, mm -hmm. i wanted to intervene and the only way to uh, effectively intervene is to be a aggressive uh, to shut down operations blocking harassing uh, and uh, it's worked out quite well for you know for 45 years we've shut down we, we drove the Japanese whaling fleet out of the southern ocean we shut down hundreds of illegal uh, operations poaching operations and uh, through direct intervention what does that look like then so you say direct intervention but aggressive um, and not but not injuring people like what exactly give us a few examples of what that would be or what that has been actually what you've actually done well without injuring anybody we can certainly target uh, equipment uh, which is being used illegally so that means cutting nets uh, blockading uh, vessels uh, getting in their in their way uh, damaging their property I mean in 1986 for example we sank ha half of Iceland's whaling fleet and destroyed their whale processing plant and shut them down for a number of years I saw this um clip from the documentary actually which which was probably i guess you'd correct me if i'm wrong may have been the first time you you did this kind of action um you were i believe it was against the norwegian whalers um you said you you took they were clubbing so not whalers um norwegian seal hunters um you took one of the clubs they were clubbing baby seals you took one threw it away and then you locked yourself onto the um they were using a rope to drag the seal skins back onto the boat and you locked yourself onto it um, and that was a particularly, that really stood out to me because of what they did to you, you know, putting, throwing you in the water and, you know, almost killing you, um, in the icy water because they, you know, trying to, trying to scare you, I suppose, trying to hurt you for trying to stop them from doing their, their work. Am I, am I right? Was that the, Nor the Norwegians? And was that the first time? That's 1977. And, uh, that was a combination of, uh, my aggressive, uh, nonviolence and Greenpeace tactics. Right. And the Greenpeace tactics was to handcuff uh, myself to those winch. Uh, you know, it's a lot of Gandhi and approach to it, you know, yep. putting your life on the line and everything. And I found that that really doesn't work. But um, what I did by grabbing the sealer's club and throwing it in the water saved the life of the seal. Yep. But Greenpeace hauled me up on the carpet for that and accused me of theft and violence that I stole <laughs> man's property and destroyed it. And I said, well, I saved the seal's life. That's what I was there for. And uh, so I left Greenpeace because of that. I understand um, that that's it's really disappointing to to have done something so brave and and these people are violent people, right? You could it could have easily gone wrong. You put your life on the line, and you know to be to be thrown under the bus like that must have been disappointing. When I saw that a documentary, um, that really stood out to me as like, wow, that that seemed like a defining moment for you and for 
how you would go on from there on is would you would you agree with that that, that was a turning point for you yeah like I, I felt we had to be effective and the only way to be effective was to be to be aggressive and yeah it's risky but uh the the results have been very good. I mean, we have saved literally thousands and thousands of whales and hundreds of thousands of sharks and, and turtles and so many other species. Yeah. Uh, so I think that the risks were, were, were well worth it. And people say, you know, I used to ask my crew, uh, are you willing to risk your life to protect a whale? And uh, if they said no, then I said, well, then we don't want you. And when people yeah. said, that's pretty unreasonable asking young people to risk their life to protect a whale. And and my logic is, is why we ask young people all the time to risk their life, uh, to even give their life for flags and property and oil wells and religion and real estate. So I think it's a far more noble thing to uh, risk your life to protect an endangered species or a threatened habitat. Absolutely. And they're, they're far more vulnerable than the most vulnerable human as well, because they, you know, they, they don't have the rights that humans are afforded. They, they can't speak the language. They often can't defend themselves. They have the mental, they have the capacity, the mental capacity of children, right? So it's, 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 it's what you said as well as that, they're, they're, they're so defenseless. Um, the most defenseless beings on the planet, aren't they? Um, the non, non-human animals. So um, I would, I would disagree on intelligence. So I happen to think a lot mm-hmm. of species are more intelligent than we are. It's just mm-hmm. how we measure intelligence. We measure intelligence by Ida hand coordination by the ability to manipulate uh, technology tools um, mm. you know, if a blob of protoplasm stepped out of a spaceship with a ray gun we wouldn't hesitate to say oh that's an intelligent creature <laughs> but we don't understand non-manipulative intelligences where you know right. species don't need to manipulate tools i think whales and dolphins are far more intelligent than we are and when I was debating a whaler one time on this subject, he said, well, Watson, you say that whales are more intelligent than people. This is this is insane. And I said, well, George, you know, I measure intelligence by the ability to live in harmony with the natural world. And by that criteria, whales are far more intelligent than we are. And he looked at me and he said, well, by that criteria, cockroaches are more intelligent than we are. I said, George, <laughs> you're beginning to understand what I'm trying to tell you. Yeah, that's a really good point, isn't it? When you, if that's how we're going to judge intelligence, we are that we're the lowest, <laughs> we're at the bottom of the pile, definitely. So that that, as I said, that moment with the um, of you stepping in and stop and saving that seal, and 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 all the moments with, in, especially in this documentary with you with the seals, were pretty standout moments and pretty amazing. But is is there a moment that stands out to you as a uh, like a, a, a moment you're particularly, I don't think proud would, would be the word, but something you think about where you think, I'm just so happy that I was, I did that. I was able to, wh- whatever it may be, you know, where you did something that was, was just very powerful and effective. Well, shutting down all the pirate whaling operations uh, in the Atlantic, shutting down Iceland, uh, driving the Japanese whaling fleet out of the Southern Ocean Whale Sanctuary. These are all things that uh, I'm quite proud of. Unfortunately, the organization that I uh, established after Greenpeace Sea Shepherd is not so proud of it. And last year, I was forced out of my the organization I founded uh, because I was too controversial, <laughs> too confrontational. They actually said uh, my history, which has made them what they are today, uh, they said my history was an embarrassment to, to them because they want to work with governments and they want to work with corporations. And uh, my approach was... Uh, unacceptable. So uh, I left Sea Shepherd to establish the Captain Paul Watson Foundation Mm -hmm. uh, to carry on the work I've been doing for 45 years. And I called it the Captain Paul Watson Foundation because I said, well, you know, they can't take that my name away from me. (laughs) Yeah. But they're actually suing me now in court, uh, claiming that I have no rights to my own personal name. Uh, They're, they're, cases saying that uh, my name is too intimately connected with uh, Sea Shepherd and therefore represents, in, according to the document, unfair trade uh, competition and thus causing irreparable damage to the brand, mm. they call it. So uh, wow. so they're at my own organization is is suing me, but uh, we'll, wow. get, we'll get through it. Like, uh, you know, the most important thing is that the work we do. And uh, yeah. last week, uh, we're, we scored an incredible victory uh, in getting the French government to uh, shut down the fishery that's uh, killing um, that's killing dolphins. And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, thousands and thousands of dolphins have been killed by that French uh, gillnet fishery. Uh, the dolphins are a bycatch of the, of the, of the fishery. Mm-hmm. And it's illegal under French law. It's illegal under EU law, but nobody was doing any action. So... In 2020, I uh, came up with the idea. I said, okay, well, these corpses are watch- washing up on the beaches, but they're out of sight. Nobody mm-hmm. sees them. Take the bodies and 
dump them in front of the Eiffel Tower, put them on the steps of the National Assembly, put them on the steps of the European Parliament. And they did. And uh, that got everybody's attention. If the story's big, um, they'll they'll push it. It'll go everywhere. Right. You've, you've got to you've got to play that game to to get things done. Right. And you've been pretty masterful at that over the years. Well, it's understanding the rules of media. I mean, the media only understands four elements, sex, scandal, violence, and celebrity. If it doesn't have one of those elements, it's not really a story. Mm -hmm. And if it has all those elements, it becomes a super story. For instance, a couple of years ago, uh, the, the, the Russians had uh, some belugas and orcas in captivity in Vladivostok and were preparing to sell them to China. And uh, we um, had to come up with a way to stop them. How do you reach the Russian government? Uh, I wrote a, you know, a speech <laughs> to the Russian government. They're not going to listen to me. So mm. we simply put those words into the hands of Pamela Anderson, and she went over to Russia, and they certainly paid attention to her. And uh, the dolphins, uh, uh, the orcas, and the beluvas were released. What you just said about the four things the media needs, you, you achieved it there because there was all these rumors that there was something going on between Pamela Anderson and uh, Putin, right? And so you had the scandal as well, and it and it, it exploded. And I, and I didn't even know that that this was kind of, I didn't know you were behind this. I didn't know this was your, but you really do understand the media because that's that that really it's still going now. They're still talking about it. Just a couple of weeks ago, it came up again. Yeah, well, I learned the lesson uh, back in 1977 when we were opposing the Canadian Norwegian seal hunt, and uh, uh, I took uh, Bridget Bardot out to the ice floes and. Uh, the picture of her cheek to cheek with a baby seal that guaranteed us the cover of every major magazine in the world and uh, helped contribute to ending the, the killing of the baby seals. As you've already uh, mentioned, you've been defending whales, seals, sharks, fish, basically all marine life um, from plankton to blue whales. Uh, you 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 defend, right? You, you value. For someone who's wondering why why plankton, for example, all the way up to blue whales, why everything in between, like what? What is getting you out there on the sea and so passionate about defending all of these creatures and even down to the smallest ones? Well, the one thing I've been saying oh, for years is this simple thing. It's uh, if the ocean dies, we die. We are dependent upon a healthy ocean for our survival. Since 1950, there's been a 40% diminishment in phytoplankton populations in the sea. And phytoplankton provides up to 70% of the oxygen in the air we breathe and sequesters enormous amounts of CO2. If phytoplankton disappears from the sea, we die. We don't live on this planet. Life as we know it will cease to exist. What is causing this? Why is there this diminishment of phytoplankton? Because we're diminishing populations of whales and seals and seabirds and dolphins. And those are the species that provide the nutrients for the phytoplankton. Whales are literally the farmers of the ocean. They're fertilizing the crops of phytoplankton. One blue whale every day dumps three tons of uh, feces, which is uh, rich in uh, magnesium and iron and uh, and nitrogen. And uh, these are the nutrients that are required. So when you reduce other fish populations and or, uh, marine mammal populations, you're going to reduce phytoplankton populations. It's as simple as that. Everything is interconnected. There are three basic laws of ecology. If we're going to survive, we have to understand them. One is the law of diversity, that uh, the strength of an ecosystem is dependent upon diversity within it. Two, that all those species within an ecosystem are interdependent with each other. And three, there's a law, it's a law of finite resources. There's a limit to growth and there's a limit to carrying capacity. When one species steals the carrying capacity of others, it causes diminishment of those species, which leads to diminishment of diversity and interdependence. And that leaves us in a very uh, weak uh, situation. Mm -hmm. If you compare the planet to a spaceship, which is what it is. We're on this incredible voyage around the Milky Way galaxy, and every spaceship has a life support system that provides us with the food we eat, the air we breathe, and regulates climate and temperature. And that spaceship is run by a crew, a crew of engineers that keep everything running. And uh, we humans, well, we're, we're passengers, we're having a wonderful time amusing ourselves, but we're not crew. But what we are doing is we're murdering the engineers, we're killing the crew. And there's only so many crew members you can kill before the um, machinery begins to break down. Mm -hmm. A world without bees, without worms, without uh, microbes, without uh, you know, without whales, without fishes, uh, without trees. These are the things that keep this planet uh, livable. And without them, we can't survive. I mean, we also have to have the humility to understand that a lot of these species, they don't need us, but we sure as hell need them. We don't live on a planet without bees. We don't live on a planet without worms. So we have to you know, be humble and accept the fact that... Uh, these creatures, uh, all these species are worthy of respect and survival. And when you consider that there's over 
was it 10 million fishing boats on the seas, which they're actively out there killing our engineers, killing the crew. It's, it's not, it's not a small amount, 10 million. It's, it's, it's incredible. Um, and, and another thing that, that shocked me as well, I, I can't remember the percentage. You're going to have to tell me you, you were talking about, um, how most or most, a lot of the fish that's being served in, um, just average restaurants, you know, they're actually caught illegally. So it's, it's, uh, what was the percentage of that? About 40 percent, and there's no way to that's really, uh, you can't, there are no sustainable fisheries. They don't exist. Mm -hmm. Overfishing everything. This word sustainable is being used to justify everything these days. Mm -hmm. But heavy gear industrialized fishing operations are destroying the planet, really just strip mining the life of the sea. You know, 100 mile long mm -hmm. gill nets, 100 mile long long lines, super trawlers, giant mm -hmm. purse stainers. We pulled one net from the Southern Ocean. It was, we pulled it up from two kilometers. It was 72 kilometers long and it weighed 70 tons. Jeez. And that was a net to go after, to illegally go after uh, Patagonia and Antarctic toothfish, which, by the way, is called in restaurants Chilean sea bass. It's not from right. Chile, it's not a bass, but you know, it's easier to market under Chilean sea bass than, than toothfish. But here's the situation you go down to the Southern Ocean, you catch this big fish, and then you put it in a freezer, then you take it to a port, then you put it on a plane, and then you send it off to New York or to London. This is not sustainable. And the mm -hmm. fishing industry says, well, you know, people need fish to survive. And, you know, who, who are we to take the fish out of their mouths? You know, if you have a small fishing boat going out of uh, Nigeria or the Philippines, fine. That's called sustainable fishing. But uh, sending a, a fish from the Southern Ocean to a restaurant in New York, that's not sustainable. In fact, it's, right. it's, it's absurd. And so I, we're, it, we're kind of comparing, yeah, we're, we're comparing what people do for survival. Uh, they, they literally may not have a choice versus someone in yeah someone sat in central new york who can has just ample opportunity to buy whatever they want from multiple grocery stores multiple restaurants it's just it's it's apples and oranges isn't it um, no, I, was raised in a, I was raised in a fishing village in eastern canada so i've seen the diminishment mm. and also seen the incredible rise in prices for for you know fish and uh, other uh, species from the ocean you know back in when i was uh, young i mean we wouldn't pay that kind of money for what they're paying for now i was raised in a lobster fishery and you know lobsters used to be called the poor man's meat because mm. uh nobody wanted them and suddenly they become in fashion and now everybody wants them but mm. <laughs> it just goes up and down in, in that way so fish which are were unwanted for instance turbo turbot was considered a trash fish and nobody ate it but with the decline of cod suddenly turbot's on the menu at big prices it's like i call it adaptation to diminishment as things become diminished we uh we just adapt to that fact if this is 1965 and i were to say to you you know uh, we're going to be buying water in plastic bottles and paying more for that water than the equivalent amount of gasoline you would look at me like no nobody's going to do that that's insane but here in new york city uh which has the cleanest tap water in the country coming through these stone tunnels from the catskills and the adirondacks uh, people still buy water, they, even though the right. water in the bottle is not as good as the water coming out of their tap. And in fact, it's gotten so absurd that people in Los Angeles are actually buying bottled New York tap water. Right, okay. Right. You mentioned that as well in the documentary, that the, the, the people doing the fishing, it's not in their best interest to be sustainable. It's actually in their best interest to deplete the population as much as possible, because if, if, the, if any of these fish go extinct, they've got the most valuable commodity on the market. So that's what you're talking about when you're talking about adapting. I mean, it's why would they want to slow down? Why would, why would they do that? You know, industrialized fishing isn't, you know, it's not about the, you know, the little guy going out in his boat in the early hours of the morning to catch a fish. Industrialized fishing are huge corporations and all they're interested in is short-term investment for short-term gain. Mm -hmm. Mitsubishi could stop by catching um, bluefin tuna today. And they would still have enough in their warehouses mm -hmm. in Japan to supply their market for the next decade. And that would allow the bluefin to recover. But if the bluefin were to, numbers were to increase, that would lower the, the demand. I mean, the, the, they would lower the, lower the scarcity. They need the scarcity yep. to keep the prices up. So, mm -hmm. and if it were to go extinct, they would actually have an invaluable commodity, something that nobody else has and they could sell it for right. incredible amounts. I mean, the bluefin tuna is already the most expensive fish on the planet. And uh, so scarcity translates into uh, 
you know, higher prices. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and that's sort of really the bottom line on that. Yeah. Uh, they're not interested in the future. They don't care about the future. They, the, the future to them is uh, the quarterly report and how much money their uh, shareholders right. are going right. to get. That's that's their future. I mean, the West Coast Canadian fishery is controlled by one man, uh, Jimmy Pattison, a former used car salesman. He controls the whole thing. He basically tells the government what the regulations are going to be. And that's right. why we're seeing the collapse of the herring fishery. The uh, salmon farms in British Columbia, Chile, Tasmania are insidious these salmon farms first of all to raise one fish on a salmon farm you have to catch 60 fish in the ocean to turn it into fish meal to feed them uh and then the fishery because they're concentrated it's like concentration camps of fish uh they're liable to get viruses and diseases and everything so what that means is i have to intensively uh feed them antibiotics and chemicals and everything but they're spreading the viruses that they uh get to indigenous salmon populations if you or I were to take a couple of piranhas and put them into a stream in you know, America or Europe or anywhere, that would be illegal. You're introducing an exotic species into an ecosystem that doesn't belong. But here we are taking the Atlantic salmon, a bigger predator than the salmon on the Pacific coast. We're taking this Atlantic salmon and putting it into a foreign ecosystem where it escapes, where it causes all sorts of problems, where it transmits diseases. And because mm-hmm. it's a multi-billion dollar industry, they are exempt from the law. When you take all that into consideration, your methods are more needed than ever, ever before. Like any organization that was doing what you were doing shouldn't be looking at moving away from that. They should be looking at ramping it up. Why is it that Sea Shepherd? Do you think they've, they're going? Are they going the way of Greenpeace? And if they are going that to that direction, why is that? What at this point, this pinnacle time, why are they going the opposite direction? Well, I think it's popularity because of our whale wars show. We got a lot of popularity. We got a lot of support. We caught, we became bigger. Right. And the bigger an organization gets, the more it gets into control of its accountants and uh, the people who have different agendas. Right. And that was the case with uh, with Sea Shepherd. Uh, a lot of people okay. had nice, comfortable jobs because of me. <laughs> and uh, uh, then I was told that, well, we're going in a different direction. We you know, we, we don't want to be controversial, we don't want to be confrontational. And June of 2022, I was brought before the board and uh, they said that they're going to change the course of the organization, the focus to be more science oriented, working in partnerships with governments and corporations to be, you know, less confrontational. And, and I said, uh, no, I can't support that. I didn't set Sea Shepherd up to, to be that. Right. And uh, the, the new chairman of the board looked at me and says, you work for Sea Shepherd. You're a you're an employee. You do what you're told. And I said, no, I, I don't think so. So I, I resigned. But I was still a, a member of the global board. But they, the the guy who's controlling Sea Shepherd now, covertly registered for trademarks to my the name I created and the logos I designed. And uh, he just told uh, global the global board uh, that they had to dismiss me. So without a meeting, without a discussion, without a vote, I, I received an email saying you're dismissed, and I haven't heard from anybody ever since on that. And now they're suing. They're suing uh, Sea Shepherd France, Sea Shepherd UK, and Sea Shepherd Brazil because those organizations are remaining true to our original agenda. Mm -hmm. Uh, but they're also trying to take complete control to the point where they're saying that I have no right to even use my own name. So it's, uh, it's incredible that they're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars of donors money on lawyers to stop the founder of the organization from, uh, continuing to do the work that I've always done. They disagree with uh, that approach this Mm -hmm. summer, uh, where I'm taking, uh, my ship, our first ship for the foundation, uh, we're taking it to Iceland uh, to defend endangered fin whales. Mm-hmm. And um, they're against that. They think that uh, it's going to upset the Icelandic government. Of course, it's going to upset the Icelandic government. That's the whole point. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Disagreeing isn't a problem, right? You know, go in a different direction or wanting to change and stuff like that. Yeah, fine, fine, fine. If that, you know what I mean? That can be debated. That can be discussed. What sickens me about the whole thing and what actually got me quite angry when I was discussing it with my partner when this first happened was that with what you've done and the things you've sacrificed and the threats you've had, um, you're on the red, red notice from Japan. You've got a red notice from Japan. As you've said, that uh, correctly so, that's usually for drug traffickers and drug lords and, you know, the worst people on earth. You're on that list for, for doing this work, just literally for trying to, and, and for, for the organization to treat you like you're some kind of, 
I don't know, dirt. It's just, I mean, you can disagree respectfully, right? You, you can have a respectful conflict. This, this is just complete and utter zero respect treating you like, um, you've like, you've like, I don't know, like, like dirt basically. That, that's what really shocked me about this whole thing. I've never killed anybody. I've never injured anybody. Uh, uh, Japan put me on the Interpol, uh, gave Interpol red notice on the charge of conspiracy to trespass on a whaling ship. I mean, nobody's ever been charged with trespassing on the red notice, <laughs> but it shows you how much power they have. Yeah. Because it did cost them a lot of money by driving them out of the Southern Ocean. And we're going to go back because we expect Japan to go back next year because they're just completing construction of a $67 million factory ship. And the only place that that that's, can be used is in the Southern Ocean. So we expect to confront them again. Wow. Our targets have always been outlaws, illegal operations. Uh, but these outlaws have a lot of money and a lot of right. political pull, uh, you know, in governments and whatever. So it's uh, we're up against a, a lot of odds. But you know, the ocean is still the Wild West. There is no marshal there, <laughs> uh, you know, and these people get away with what they're doing because of lack of enforcement. I mean, we just had everybody applauding the fact that the United Nations just passed a high seas treaty or. It's meaningless. It means nothing without enforcement. All of these treaties are just words on paper. That's all it is. And unless you have enforcement, it's just, I don't know why everybody's patting themselves on the back because nothing's right. going to change really there. And when we do go out and change it, uh, we're considered to be, you know, terrorists or whatever. I remember I did the Bill Maher show one time and he says, well, people are calling you an eco-terrorist. And I said, I don't really know why. I've never worked for Monsanto. Uh, <laughs> But that's uh, that's the reality of it. Is the yep. people who are destroying this planet are the real radicals. In fact, nobody gets more conservative than us. I mean, we're the conservatives, which means we're conservationists, and that is the root word of, uh, for conservative is conservation. And yeah. that, we've just completely turned the language upside down uh, in that respect. So yeah. we're not doing anything. Uh, it, it, you know, we're not we're operating within the boundaries of the law and the boundaries of practicality, but the law can be manipulated. I'm actually officially a pirate. Uh, uh, Judge Alex Kaczynski uh, of the Ninth Circuit, he didn't charge me with anything for that. Uh, I wasn't convicted of anything, but he's on record as saying, well, uh, Watson's a, a real pirate. You don't have to do this to be a pirate. And he is a real pirate. But it's sort of a badge of honor to the fact that I'm considered a pirate by a man was then later uh, had to resign from the bench because of uh, uh, using court com computers to download pornography and for sexual harassment. And he had the gall to call me a pirate for fine. <laughs> <laughs> wow. The people that's usually, yeah, the ones that have something to hide are usually the ones that go out and project, right? It's projection. Uh, come and attack you like that. Yeah. Happens quite a lot. Well, um, the guy who's now uh, in charge of Sea Shepherd is a Floridian property developer who holds hunting fishing licenses in Alaska and in Florida and owns a fishing lodge in Alaska. He's the guy in charge of Sea Shepherd now. Wow. And the problem is, is our supporters are just not aware of that because they're yeah. not informed. And, uh, you know, they're, what they've done is remove me from the website. That they're trying to erase my history, all 45 years of it, like I never existed. Uh, so, I mean, something the Bolsheviks used to do, you know, <laughs> if it's money driven, it's just so incredibly disappointing that this is all that just, you know, ab absolute power corrupts, right? Money, money corrupts people. If that's what's going on, then that's just incredibly disappointing on so many levels. Yeah. Um, but at least you've got your foundation, at least you're going ahead, at least you've got a crew and you've got support. Um, it looks like I've checked your website, I've checked your supporters. It looks like quite a lot of people came over with you and stayed with you, which is fantastic that that, that you've still got that support going. Um, I have one more question for you, as I know I know we've we've only got 30 minutes. Um, despite both animal people and anti-animal people coming for you trying to stop you from what you're doing. I mean, you're getting, you got it from your own side, you got it from the other side. How, how are you still going forward and staying strong? Well, you know, I've always said, if it isn't something, it's something else, but it's always something that you have to deal with. But way back in 1973, I was a medic for the American Indian Movement during the occupation of Wounded Knee. And we were surrounded by 3,000 federal agents that are shooting at us. Uh, uh, they killed two. They wounded 46. I, I went to Russell Means, who was the leader of the American Indian Movement. And I said, you know, we don't have any hope of winning here. The odds against us are overwhelming. So what are we doing here? And he said something to me, which has stayed with me ever since. And that is, uh, well, we're not concerned about the odds against us. And we're not concerned about winning or losing. 
we're here because it's the right place to be, the right time to be here, and the right thing to do. Don't worry about the future. You have no power in the future. All your power rests in the present. And what you do in the present will define what the future will be. And so that's what I do. I, I just thought, okay, here I am. I'm in this situation. Uh, it's what I do today, which will define what will be here tomorrow. But I can't be pessimistic. I can't be depressed about the whole thing. You just carry on. And I found that through the application of the virtues of passion and courage and imagination, you can change the world. You can do incredible things. And individuals all over the world, from Greta Thunberg to Diane Fossey, Jane Goodall, people, you know, Dr. Sylvia Earle have done incredible things uh, just by focusing that passion, that courage, and that imagination in the right direction. An incredible ending to the interview. I think really inspirational words for anyone who's uh, looking for that, you know, to keep keep going strong. For all the all the vegans out there, all the animal rights activists, that's definitely a message that we all need to hear. Thank you so much for coming on. Is there anything you wanted to, to add? Uh, anything I didn't get into you wanted to mention? Uh, no, that just in two months we'll be setting sail for Iceland and uh, um, that'll probably be, be quite the story. So if people can follow that on our website. Perfect, perfect. And um, yeah, so that's, that's the uh, Captain Paul Watson Foundation. Um, I'll link the website in the uh, in the description and the pinned comments. Everybody can go and check it out. Um, and again, thank you so much and all the best of luck with that and, and everything else you do in the future. I'll be, I'll be following closely and supporting you wherever I can. Well, thank you very much.